What's going on, guys? This past week has been slower, I guess you could say, as far as kinetic events here in the U.S. go. So that gave me some time to do a dedicated comms video. Now, in the past, I've talked about the different emergency communications protocols across the varying radio disciplines. I've done videos on them, things like the Wilderness Protocol or the 333 or Prepper Radio Protocol. And the most recent one was on the Adventure Radio Protocol. And basically what all of them have incorporated into each system in one sense or another is simply redundancy. Now, if your comms plan depends on one device or one frequency or really one of anything, it's already failed. You probably just don't know it yet. Now, there are a lot of people out there that still think that one device is enough. Maybe it's a phone, maybe some sort of GPS unit, maybe some sort of smartwatch with an SOS feature. But when things go sideways, storms, injuries, a lost trail, that one device really becomes the one point of failure. In today's modern age, we're conditioned to believe that the phone is almost like the center of our universe. It can be our map, it can be our lifeline, and sometimes it can pretty much be our everything. But there are plenty of locations and situations in which cell service just ceases to exist. And at that point, you're gonna find yourself where it's just you in the environment or situation with whatever gear you thought was gonna be enough. Now, here's how I layer my comms, and yeah, Pace planning has been beaten into us if you have spent any time diving into emergency preparedness, but there's a reason for that. And that is quite simply, it works. Now, we're the primary. That's gonna be our phone. Now, obviously that comes with the need or at least the want for it to be fully charged. Also to have your offline maps downloaded. But the kicker is it's still fragile. I mean, let's face it, it it's, still, it's still a piece of glass. And speaking of wanting things charged, there is something I found um, that I have really loved. And it is my go-to ruggedized power bank. And that is the Nest Out 15,000N. There, it's their rugged outdoor power bank. So as you guessed it, the 15,000 kind of stands for that it's 15,000 milliamps. And by rugged... You know, I'm always preaching about this. This thing actually holds an IP67 rating, meaning that it can survive submersion for 30 minutes in one meter of water. It's also fully dust sealed. Uh, and on top of that, it meets the mill standard 810G drop test standard. And it does this by having an internal silicone uh, shock absorbing cushion and then this like hard shell exterior. So this thing is definitely built for harsh environments, if that's really where you're planning on going with it. Um, things like water, dust, dropping it, the cold, uh, and even vibrations it's protected from. Now, form factor, this is definitely not the smallest device out there for sure. It's definitely not your urban EDC battery. This thing is built for field use. It's part of Nest Out's modular outdoor ecosystem, which I have really come to love, meaning that it's not just a battery, it really becomes a platform for different lights, different mounts, different accessories. Getting into this, it has three ports, um, one USB-C and then two USB-As, and that gives you a total output of 32 watts. And one of the coolest things is it also automatically detects device requirements and adjusts its output accordingly. And from if, it, if you drain this thing all the way down, it will fully recharge in about three and a half hours. And to just kind of put that in perspective of what it can do, that it will give you about three full iPhone charges or like nine full charges if you're using it to charge a headlamp. Um, and speaking of accessories, so I got mine with the camp lantern. So this is cool. So basically, you know, I spent a lot more time uh, living in a tent than... I would, most people would like to do, especially come August and September. But basically this just screws on and you can see it's got an O-ring, it's all sealed from dust and water. Flip it on here, it's adjustable for its brightness. It's really nice. I also got it with the 
tripod, which also has a hook that you can hang it from. And I also got the 28 watt uh, portable solar panel with it as well. And this comes with the Maxion solar panels, um, which are really nice because they're kind of a top tier panel. They're very efficient. And it's really convenient because it comes in this foldable nylon case and it even has these two stands sewn into it. So you can adjust this thing to give you the best sun angle when you need it. And in addition to that, the solar controller is up here kind of in its own separated case. And this actually has two separate USB-A ports on it. So you can actually charge your power bank and a different device at the same time. So yeah, there's that. Um, sorry, this wasn't supposed to be a complete breakdown video of this thing. Uh, it's just that this is a really good piece of gear that I have really come to like. So just wanted to pass it along. But moving on with pace, next would be your alternate. So some sort of satellite capable device now Yes, I am aware that the new iPhones have a GPS capability. I've actually used it uh, last year when I was out in Colorado and it's pretty cool. It's very slow. You definitely gotta sit there and like keep the satellite in line, but it does work. This is also about redundancy. Um, so in our system, having a completely different band and device from cellular. So this could even be kind of what is my go-to, even your, you know, portable Starlink or even a Garmin inReach. Now, moving to the contingent. This is where I'm going to designate two-way radio capabilities, whether it's HAM, FRS, GMRS, MERS. You know, contingent is where you can kind of start to get creative. For me, it's HAM radio coupled with our business band radios. I like the range and the repeaters and kind of the community that comes along, um, especially that's, you know, associated with the HAM side of things. But it doesn't have to be ham. Use what you know and use what your group uses. That's kind of the best way I can do it. Now, the point is, once again, this layer doesn't rely on the same infrastructure as your phone or as the satellites. So finally, we would have the exigent. And guys, this could be virtually anything you can think of as a way to communicate with someone else. It's Basically, where we say, forget anything electronic and we're going full analog. Um, this can be a whistle, signal mirror, smoke signals. I mean, look at beach lifeguards. Uh, they go back and they still, a lot, at a lot of places, incorporate flags into their comms. Um, for me personally, it kind of depends what capacity I'm working in. If I'm out west at a fire somewhere, I have a Fox 40 whistle tethered to whatever chest frig it is that I'm wearing. Uh, and if I'm home in my law enforcement capacity, we actually have everything kind of like in our line of communications down to as an absolute lasting resort of discharging a firearm as a call for needs of assistance when everything else has failed. Really just boils down to having a capability where there's no batteries, no firmware updates, no subscriptions for it to work. So all of that said, you know, this is redundancy. This is not gear hoarding by any means. It's not paranoia. It really just comes down to just smart planning. When you're out there and your battery dies or your signal drops, especially if you're alone, redundancy at that point stops being a luxury and becomes your survival plan. Every rescue story you've ever heard probably has one thing in common. First and foremost, something failed. And then usually someone had a backup, which is how the whole rescue was even possible to happen. Now, I mentioned that I like the community that goes along with ham radio, um, which is why I value it as part of my comms method. When storms are rolling in or some sort of disaster or crisis situation is unfolding, turn a ham radio on. Chances are really good that there are people on the local repeater, or even one of the national simplex channels talking amongst themselves about it. Additional comms go down. These guys, in my experience, are always ready to jump in and help and can do an incredible job with it too. This is where ham radio extends beyond just being a hobby and can really be a backbone um, because a lot of these ham systems and groups that are out there they are a living, breathing, just 
network of people who train and drill and show up when things go down. And even if they aren't talking about it, when you, when you turn your radio on, chances are there's definitely somebody out there listening for a call for assistance, which is really cool. And, and speaking of radio, especially analog radio, uh, another layer would be the noble weather radio, um, because weather apps fail, uh, you know, cell towers fail, but NOAA is a nationwide network broadcasting 24 seven from the nearest national weather service office. Uh, in fact, the weather alert ability was one of the features of that DM32, that Belfine DM32 radio. But I actually like one of the things that made me really like that radio is the fact that it had that in there. The thing with radio comms is that number one, radios usually don't fail, but Probably more importantly, when they do, it's obvious. There's no illusion of connectivity with them, unlike a lot of the like internet-based comms things. Here's the part nobody wants to hear. Redundancy adds complexity. More devices, more steps, more decisions, but that's really the, really the price of resilience. So. As far as you know, the redundancy goes, it really only works if you know how to use it. You have to practice, have to drill, you have to fail, and then you have to repeat until you get it right because redundancy isn't sexy. It's not flashy, but it's the reason that you make it home when things start to go bad. So let's talk about some of the mistakes and failure points that I see all of the time. First and foremost, Redundancy doesn't equal resilience. If you're primary and alternate, um, I'm looking at you, rapid radios or any other cell-based radio out there, they both rely on cell towers. So you're really not resilient if you're trying to incorporate that as one of your backups. You're really just repeating yourself by being tied into the cell network. Then there's also having the false sense of security. You know, most PACE plans, they look great on paper, but they've never been tested under stress. And then the biggest one, uh, guys, we conduct training for professionals all of the time. And all of the time we see it. Comms go out the window because there are training gaps that we've identified for sure. When the primary comms fail, people, even professionals, they freeze, they don't switch, they don't execute, they kind of just get into this panic mode. So look, by now we've spent a lot of time exploring redundancy, uh, breaking down comm systems and ideologies like the Wilderness Protocol, that 333 protocol, and the Adventure Radio Protocol. And I mean, listen, they all have their value wouldn't take that, you know, away from them at all. There's a massive flaw baked into all of it. One that's been hiding this whole time in plain sight. And in the next comms video that we do, I'm going to unravel everything we've built so far. And I can't wait to hear what you think about it in the comments. So put your best guess of what it is in the comments below. Um, and until then, build your layers, train your team. And with that, we'll see you on the next one. Be safe.